All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear members of the jury. Welcome to my thesis presentation towards a computer vision-based quality assessment of Tahitian pearls. My thesis is part of the project RAPA, Reconnaissance Automatique de la Qualité des Perles de Tahiti, which aims at developing a computer vision-based quality assessment of Tahitian pearls to support the Tahitian pearl business. The general procedure of computer vision can be roughly divided into two steps. The first one is the data acquisition step, in which we try to mimic the human visual system. And the second step, data processing, in which we process the acquired data to obtain a classification that corresponds to the human one. So if you want to, the second process tries to mimic the human processing of information in the brain. The quality of Tahitian pearls is assessed based on six main quality parameters. The pearls color, shape, surface quality, <laughs> size, luster and knacker thickness. And to the moment, the only possibility to assess the quality of a Tahitian pearl based on these parameters is to do so manually. Which means, for example, for the first six parameters, you assess the color of a pearl by simply looking at it and classifying the color based on your experience. Or for example, measuring manually the size or counting the number manually of surface defects. The procedure has two disadvantages. First of all, it is obviously very time intense because you have to do it for every single pearl that you would like to sell. Secondly, the procedure is subjective for certain parameters such as the color or the shape or the luster. If I took one pearl and I would give it to every single one of you the same pearl and ask for a color classification, you would have at least a dozen different color cl classifications at the end. So the main goal of Project Rapa is to accelerate and to objectify the quality assessment of Tahitian pearls with computer vision. Out of the six mentioned quality parameters, I've been working on two, the knacker thickness and the color. The knacker thickness is a physical parameter or a, a geometrical parameter. It's a material thickness, which means theoretically you can objectively measure this parameter. Secondly, it depends on the internal structure of the pearl, which means you cannot evaluate this perimeter by simply looking at the pearl. You somehow have to visualize the internal structure, which is here in Tahiti done with X-ray imaging, which means here are examples of X-ray images of the pearls, which means the computer vision equivalent is X-ray image processing. The color, in contrary, is a perceptual perimeter, which means we are not really capable of objectively, mathematically describing it. Secondly, and in contrary to the knacker thickness, it's, it depends on the surface appearance. And the computer vision equivalent would be to take color images of the surface of the pearl and afterwards color image processing. Which means in regards of actually any aspect, both parameters are fundamentally different. Which is why I decided to divide my thesis manuscript in two separate and independent parts. And the same I did for this presentation. We have a first part where I will present my results in regards of the automatic knacker thickness measurement with introduction, methods, results, and future work. This part is mainly settled in applied science. And a second part concerning my work on color classification, which is mainly settled in theoretical science with an introduction. Main body is theoretical work on color space theory. Afterwards, experiments, results, future work. And at the very end, a conclusion where I will summarize the complete work. So we'll start with the knacker thickness measurement. If you would like to export a Tahitian pearl or Tahitian pearls, you're not allowed to do so directly. There's a resolution that obliges you to bring, prior to the exportation, all your pearls to the Direction de Ressources Marines et Minières, DMM. At the DMM, an expert will control the quality of your pearls. And if certain of your pearls are not of sufficient quality, you are not allowed to export them. One of the quality parameters that is evaluated is the knacker thickness. As I mentioned previously, it's a perimeter that depends on the internal structure of the pearl, which means these, the internal structure has to be somehow visualized, which is done at the DMM with X-ray images according to the following procedure. An expert of the DMM takes a support with 300 boreholes, 15 by 20, and places in each borehole a pearl. Then he takes the whole support and places the support, barely visible, into the X-ray machine here. He switches on the X-ray gun, and the pearls that are under the X-ray gun will be radiographed and the X-ray images, the resulting X-ray images shown on the screen. He then visually analyzes the image and analyzes the internal structure of the Asian pearls. The internal structure is mainly defined by three characteristic regions that I will explain with these two images. The first image is a mechanically bisected Tahitian pearl. 
The second one is one of the actual X-ray images that we obtained from the DMM with a pearl that is not the same but very similar to the bisected one. First is the nucleus. Here is an example of the blank nucleus, an artificially formed sphere that is inserted in the pearl oyster during the grafting procedure. Accordingly, the nucleus is within the pearl and appears as a circle in the X-ray images. Second region, the nacre that is deposited by the pearl oyster around the nucleus. And the third region, very specifically relevant for Tahitian pearls, cavities, which means regions where we have neither nucleus material nor nacre material. These regions appear as slightly gray regions within the X-ray images. So what the expert is actually doing, he is evaluating the NACA thickness profile of the pearl, which means he is evaluating the distance of the outer boundary or from the outer boundary of the pearl until either cavities or the nucleus. And the current uh, quality threshold is to evaluate if more than 20% of the NACA thickness profile are lower than 0.8 millimeters or not. If your pearls have a NACA thickness of 20% uh, of the NACA thickness lower than 0.8 millimeters, you are not allowed to export them. And that's actually the procedure that we would like to automatize with one restriction set by the DMM. The automatic procedure has to be done in at least one second or faster. As in the ideal case, a DMM expert is capable of evaluating a support completely filled with pearls in five minutes. 300 pearls, five minutes, one second per pearl. So we developed a methodology that consists of five different steps. The first step is the segmentation from, of the pearl from the background, which gives us, as a result, the outer boundary of the pearl. Second step, nucleus detection. Third step, cavity detection. Now we have sufficient information to eliminate or to delete everything out of the image but the NACA region. Which means now in the fourth step we can calculate the distance from the outer boundary of the NACA to the inner boundary of the NACA, which gives us the NACA thickness profile of the pearl. And afterwards, in a, in a fifth step, uh, decide whether to reject the pearl or not. The first step for the pearl segmentation, we developed a model-based approach, which is quite a standard approach in image processing, where you create a model of the background, afterwards subtract the background from the image, and what remains is your object. If you only have one object. In our case, we have the background, which is the borehole of the support and the surface of the support, and one pearl that is situated in the, pore, in the borehole and partially surpassing the borehole. As we know the geometry of the support, we can create an artificial or synthetic background image that is cut, unfortunately, based on the geometry of the support in the first step. The second step is to calibrate the X-ray images so that the image intensity corresponds to the material thickness of the radiographed scene. Meaning, for example, in this region where the pearl surpasses the borehole, we have now an intensity that corresponds to the thickness of the support plus the thickness of the pearl. As we have calibrated both images, we can now mathematically subtract the artificial background from the original image, which means thickness of the background plus thickness of the pearl minus the thickness of the background gives us the pure pearl, more or less. There are two more, it's very unfortunate, two more image processing steps that are thresholding and artifact cleaning so that at the very end we obtain the pure region of the pearl, which means the outer boundary of the pearl. Actually in the presentation on the screen it's not cut, so both options aren't ideal. The second step is a heuristic nucleus detection, which bases on the idea that we initialize a small circle within the nucleus region, and then iteratively increase the radius of the, of the artificial circle, while at every iteration assuring that the, that the artificial circle stays within the nucleus. Which means, if it always stays within the nucleus, the radius is increased constantly, that at one certain point the circle will cover the outer boundary of the nucleus. So we have to assure that the nucleus stays within the, uh, that the artificial circle, the moving circle, stays within the nucleus, which we do with a moving function like this, based on a probability, on a logical boundary probability bi that we calculate for each pixel of the circle at each iteration. Logical boundary probability means either zero or one. Then we calculate the moving function as sum of the boundary probability functions of each pixel multiplied by the normal vector of each pixel. Example, we have the artificial circle and we only consider the north, south, east and west pixel, each one with a normal vector. Now we assume the boundary probability is 1 
for the north pixel and one for the east pixel. They both touch the nucleus boundary. The remaining two pixels have a boundary uh, probability zero. Now we multiply the, multi multiply the boundary probability with the normal vectors and calculate the sum, which gives us a moving direction away from the probable boundary. All right? So the boundary probability, the first one, is a gradient-based boundary probability that is based on <laughs> a simplified model of the material thickness in x-y direction that's in, like, uh, schematically our pearl with the cavity and the nucleus. If we are close to or at the center of the nucleus, we have the region of highest material thickness. The further we go away in direction of the nucleus boundary, the more the material thickness decreases. equivalently, the more the image intensity decreases. Afterwards, we pass the cavity and we come to the beginning of the NACA, where we have again a local maximum, which means we are looking actually for local infliction points, which is exactly this formula. That's a logical formulation of local infliction points. If there's a local infliction point, this probability function will be one, otherwise it's zero. But we don't want to the circle to move only uh, gradient-based, as in moments that the circle does not touch the boundary, the movement would be purely defined by image noise, which is random. For these cases, we define another probability function where we set the boundary probability of each pixel equivalent to minus the image intensity, which means the movement is such that the circle is always moving to the region of highest intensity, which is still supposed to be our nuclear center or region close to the nuclear center. This whole procedure is here shown in a video. We have in red the circle initialized at the region of highest intensity because we know it's the nucleus region. In blue, we have the um, normal vectors multiplied with the boundary probability. Excuse me. In the graph on the right, we calculate the average probability of every pixel of the circle, which means the sum of the logical boundary probabilities divided by the sum of the circle pixels over each iteration. Now we are touching uh, no, bound, uh, no nucleus boundary, which means we are with the average boundary as the noise level. <coughs> We're constantly increasing the radius of the circle until one point, one region of the circle touches the nucleus boundary, which means the nucleus boundary probability of almost each pixel of the circle is one, which means, again, the moving direction will be away from the nucleus boundary, meaning we will expand the circle further in this direction. Shortly, we will pass the local maximum. And afterwards, we increase further until the nucleus touches background pixels. Because from the beginning, we don't know which magnitude the maximum of the average boundary probability will have. Afterwards, after the algor algorithm is stopped, we identify the maximum of the average boundary, boundary probability of each iteration, or of all iterations, which defines our optimal circle that is supposed to cover the nucleus boundary, such as in this example. Third step is cavity segmentation, where we applied a classical, more or less classical region growing algorithm. Region growing is typically you have some seed points with a certain definition of a region. Afterwards, you check all the neighbor pixels if they belong to the same region. If so, uh, to the same region. If so, they are aggregated to one bulk, let's say, and the aggregated pixels are now the new seed pixels. The same we will do for the cavity segmentation. We will start a region growing procedure at the outer boundary of the pearl that we identified in the first step because we know this is NACA. And then we will grow in direction of uh, increasing NACA thickness. As we suppose that the boundary of the cavity, because there suddenly is less material thickness, is at local intensity maxima. Or we stop at the previously detected nucleus, which looks like this, we are growing the region, stopping either at the nucleus boundary or at local intensity maxima, which defines the boundary of the cavity. <coughs> now, as mentioned priorly, we, are, we have done all the segmentation steps. We segmented the outer boundary of the pearl, nucleus, we detected the nucleus, we segmented the cavities, which means now we can suppress every region of the pearl but the NACA. And in the fourth step, Calculate the distance between the outer boundary of the NACA and the inner boundary of the NACA, which gives us, together with the spatial resolution of the images, the NACA thickness profile in millimeter. 
fourth step. The fifth, ah, no, it's still part of the fourth step, is to uh, decide whether to reject the pearl or not. The current rejection criterion is that if more than 20% of the 2D NACA thickness profile are less than 0.8 millimeters, we will reject the pearl, which we can do by simply applying a threshold to the, NACA, to the calculated NACA thickness profile at 0.8 millimeters counting the number of pixels that correspond to a thickness lower than uh, 0.8 millimeters divided by the total number of boundary pixels. In this case, we are at 46%, which means this pearl is a reject. Technically, we are now finished, but imaging and image processing is always subject to imprecisions that we have somehow taken to account into our decision of whether to reject the pearl or not. That's why we proposed a certainty measurement, which is basically we take the detected outer boundary and increase pixel-wise the boundary in direction of the outside pointing normal vectors. Pixel-wise meaning that we increase pixel-wise the NACA thickness, hypothetically, until a certain point. We started at 46% of the NACA thickness lower than 0.8 millimeters. This value will decrease because we artificially increase the NACA thickness until we reach a percentage that is lower than 20%. In this example, we need a shift of nine pixels of the complete outer boundary, which means as interpretation, if all the imaging imprecisions, all the image uh, processing imprecisions lead to a smaller NACA thickness of nine pixels on every point of the NACA thickness profile, this pearl would be a false reject. So we tested our algorithm with 298 X-ray images of pearls that were manually classified by the MM experts. And the results are shown here. Shown are only the pearls that were automatically detected as to reject from exportation, meaning more than 20% of the NACA thickness are lower than 0.8 millimeters, and the corresponding certainty. Out of all these 298 pixels, 13 were manually classified as to reject, which are actually all the bars in red, which means every single one of the manually classified pearls as to reject could, re could be detected as well automatically as to reject. But additionally, all the blue bars are pearls that were automatically detected as to reject, but manually as to be good for exportation. Two cases, unfortunately, are false detections due to false nucleus detection. But I proposed a procedure within the manuscript that could delete these two false rejections. Still, there are many cases that remain that could be validated actually as human misclassifications. One example, and it's even less visible than on a regular computer, are, for example, pearls that is, is the typical case where the nucleus boundary is barely visible, which means the pearl, the pearl is very, it's partly to analyze by simply looking at it. There, the uh, automatic algorithm has an advantage. A second case where there's a region that is obviously smaller than 0.8 millimeters, but it's very difficult to estimate if this region corresponds to 20% or more than 20%, especially if the pearls are non-round, if you have an irregular shape. There as well, the automatic detection has a clear advantage because the percentage of the NACA thickness that is lower than 0.8 millimeters, we can more or less calculate precisely. And the third case that is more or less an obvious reject because at more or less every region of the NACA thickness profile, we are at less than 0.8 millimeters and we have a certainty of 10 pixels, which is actually a very natural thing because you have to see that the DM experts, they control 1,000 pearls per day. They're sitting all the day in front of the computer. They always have to focus on one single perimeter, which means sooner or later, one pearl will slip through. Again, the automatic detection has an advantage because it doesn't get tired. So in summary, an automatic NACA thickness measurement of Tahitian pearls is generally possible. We had to answer this question because we were the first one who did this. And secondly, an automated evaluation is faster than the manual one. At the moment, we are at seven, at, excuse me, 0 0.7 seconds per image processing time from the first segmentation step until the decision of whether to reject the pearl or not. And thirdly, an automated evaluation is more precise than the manual one, as we have seen in the previous examples. Future work. Uh, based on the results that we have presented to a commission of the assembly of the French Polynesian territory, we got quite comfortable funding for the next project MyO that actually aims at implementing our algorithm such as at the end we have a completely automated procedure and the expert at the DMM just has to put in the support with the pearls, click on start 
And at the end, you get uh, the complete classification with several steps. One alternative <coughs> support configuration, because the current support configuration is not ideal in means of the resulting image configuration. An automated image acquisition. The images that we used were acquired manually. Of course, we have to uh, automatize this as well. Software implementation. How do we implement the algorithms that we developed in the XML, on the XML machines? And lastly, how do we communicate with the expert of the DMM? How does our software communicate with the experts? And along the whole project, of course, software adaption optimization according to all the other steps. That was part one. Now we come to part two, color classification. While in the first part, we were mainly settled in image segmentation, we are now coming to object classification and image processing which mainly follows as well two steps. The first one is called feature generation. We have an object or an image within the object which we would like to describe in respect of what we would like to classify, meaning, for example, the color or the shape or the size or anything else. We would like to create feature vectors that correlate with the character of the object based on which we would like to classify it, humanly or manually or artificially. And the second step, to do a classification based on this mathematical description of the object. The main work that I've done is focused on feature generation, more specifically on one specific procedure which is called normalized RGB histogram binning. This one or this procedure is divided in three steps, RGB normalization, chromatic index calculation and histogram binning. The first two are essential for the next section theoretical work, so I will introduce them. RGB normalization. In the beginning, we have our image. And classically or typically, the, each pixel of the image or the color of each pixel of the image is described by an RGB color vector, which means a vector in the three dimensional Euclidean RGB color, cu color cube. The RGB color model corresponds to the human biological processing of color in the retina. But what we want to do is to classify objects based on their perceived color, which means we need a perceptual color model such as, for example, the color model that is based on the three parameters U, saturation, and a certain kind of illumination parameter. This concept I will introduce geometrically within the RGB space. We have a color vector here, an RGB vector that cor corresponds to this U. If we would like to change the U, means we rotate the color vector around this black line. This black line is called the achromatic axis. It contains every gray level value of the RGB space, including black at the origin of the RGB space and pure white at the opposite corner of the RGB space. The second value, saturation. If we have a completely unsaturated color, we have a gray level value, which means typically saturation is calculated as excuse me, distance of an RGB vector to, that was one too much, to the achromatic axis. We went from gray to fully saturated blue. We have the same blue because this is the position or the angle in regards of the achromatic axis that describes a U blue. And the third component, an illumination component, that is typically described as distance to the origin of the RGB space. If there is no illumination, the object is black, every object. Now, if we go further away from the origin, our object gets illuminated from dark blue to light blue. Now, <coughs> What we would like to do if we classify objects based on their color, we are not interested in the illumination source, actually. A red object in sunlight is still red in shadow, which means the whole goal of RGB normalization is to suppress the illumination component. As we have seen, the illumination is the distance between an RGB vector and the origin of the RGB space. We can eliminate this component by shifting every RGB vector to a plane of uniform intensity. This plane is called typically the Maxwell triangle or chromatic triangle. And this procedure we can do with a very simple operation. We divide our original RGB vector by the sum of its entries. That's all. That shifts every RGB vector in this space on this plane. And this is called the normalized RGB vector, typically, typically excuse me, denoted with small letters RGB or here in vector notation. That's the first step. The second step is the chromatic index calculation out of the normalized RGB vector, which is typically done by, for example, only taking the R channel, the normalized R channel, or normalized G or normalized B channel, or certain others, like these four. In total, there are around a dozen chromatic indices that are used, 
And additionally, that's an important information, the choice of which chromatic index to use is purely empirical. There is no rule, there is no formulation of which index to use. Nonetheless, this whole procedure is very basic, very simple and very standard, very often applied. For example, in this paper where uh, the author uses the chromatic index R and the chromatic index G and applies two-dimensional histogram binning to detect in an image if a pixel belongs to human skin or not. The very same index as well on a G channel and the two-dimensional histogram binning is used in this paper to classify the color of vehicles. And again, the very same index for building recognition or, for example, for color texture, which means we have four completely different applications with completely different color distributions, but still they use exactly the same index. What I said in the beginning, what we try to do in feature generation is to create vectors that correlate with our, with our color distribution or with, our, with the character of our classes. That's not only my opinion, that's actually consensus in the domain of object classification. Like, successful classification relies on the extraction of significant features in means of our objects, or more precisely, a key ingredient in the design of visual object class classification systems is the identification of relevant class-specific aspects. Now we have seen four different applications and there are several more with completely different classes, completely different data distributions that all use the same features, which is in strong contrast to actually the general consensus of the domain. <clears throat> and generally it is likely that the same, very specific same feature will not be ideal for any application. Which means we have to ask which chromatic index is actually ideal for a, an ideal for a given application. But so far there are no deterministic methods to answer this question applied, which is not the failure of the deterministic methods. There are several, but the problem <coughs> is that we have no formalization of what normalized RGB chromatic index generation actually is, even though it is a standard procedure. <coughs> and that is the core piece of my work concerning color classification, this formalization. So we go to the theoretical work part. <coughs> the first step is to actually define what is a chromatic index mathematically. A chromatic index is a linear combination of the three normalized RGB color channels which we can write as well as a dot product, a dot product between a vector n and the RGB color channel. That's the first definition, according to the, all the chromatic indices that are used in the literature. Geometrically, that mean, this means, for example, or not for example, it's a dot product, which means we're calculating actually a distance between a plane with a normal defined by our chromatic index and an RGB color vector. As an example, if we only use, for example, the normalized R channel, as chromatic index would be the same as calcula calculating the dot product between the vector 100 and the original RGB vector, which means we are actually calculating the distance between the RGB vector and the plane that is spun spent by the blue-green axis. That is important because now we do something that is called a vector normal vector shift. Oh, well, we do a normal vector shift. That's not very intuitive why we do it. We'll come to this in page after. First of all, I will explain what this is. We had our chromatic index defined by a vector n that is a normal vector of a plane. Now we shift this normal vector by the sum of its entries divided by 3, which actually is the same as our original chromatic index minus the sum of the entries of the normal vector divided by 3. This is a scalar. And the sum of the RGB values. As the RGB values are normalized, this is 1. And we have, as a result, the shifted chromatic index is the same as the original chromatic index minus a scalar value, which means we do not change at all the information content. All the information is coded here. So we can do the shift without harming at any sort our information. Why we would like to do it? This was the original distance measurement of our uh, chromatic index uh, defined by the pure R channel as a distance measurement from this plane. This is the normal vector. Now we shift it by the sum of its entries divided by 3, which means every vector that is shifted by the sum of its entries divided by 3 is perpendicular to this line, which is, as we have seen before, the achromatic axis of the RGB space, of the original RGB space. Which means with this procedure, we have now chromatic indices that are defined as distances to planes that all contain the chromatic axis, every single one. Which means, in conclusion, 
for example, for these six, uh, six different chromatic indices, the only thing that we change is the orientation of the plane by rotating it around the achromatic axis, which means now we can math mathematically formulate a chromatic index based on a reference plane, as for example, this one that defines the achromatic index, and a rotation, which means based on a single parameter that defines the rotation alpha. And additionally, as it is a uh, rotation around the achromatic axis, it corresponds to the human perceptual parameter u, which is actually, well, there are actually two new things coded. First of all, we have formalized now the chromatic index generation. Secondly, well, that's the, the official formula. We have the, this is the, our image information, the green uh, channel and the blue channel. And this is the perimeter that we have to, that we have to optimize, that we have to find. Now we have reduced the whole problem to one single perimeter. And secondly, we have done a connection between chromatic index generation and the human perceptual perimeter U, which is as well kind of interesting. But most importantly, we have formalized this procedure, which means now we can use this formula that includes every possible chromatic index in the normalized RGB space to find ideal indexes for a given application, as, for example, the color classification of Tahitian pearls. But, well, I didn't do this yet, <laughs> because first of all, we have to analyze if actually it does a difference. Maybe all the six or ten indices that are used in the literature are already ideal. Or maybe if we, if we choose other ones based on our, of our formulation, doesn't make, a, doesn't make a big difference. So what we would like to know, does the choice of different indices influence the actual classification? And if yes, is it significant or to which degree? And there's another question, which was actually the first question of the, this part, color classification of Tahitian pearls. Is it possible to artificially classify the color of Tahitian pearls based on human perception? All these questions we can answer in one single experiment. And that's an experimental artificial classification of 150 Tahitian pearls that were classified manually by colleagues of the Ifremer Institute into eight color classes. So we took these 150 pearls, took color images of each of the pearl, and calculated for each object, for each pearl, 180 different chromatic indices based on our formula. From 0 to 179 with a 1 degree increment, which means actually the whole range of possible chromatic indices. Afterwards, we did two dimensional histogram binning with um, two indices together, one indice at a certain degree alpha and the second one at a certain degree alpha plus 120, which means we have covered the standard application of, for example, the R and the D channel from the papers that I cited priorly. That we will uh, determine as feature vector alpha. And these feature vectors we use to artificially classify the color of Tahitian pearls based on the human classification with artificial neural networks which means at the end for each human classification, you get 180 different results corresponding to each one of the different feature configurations. And the results look, for example, like this. This is one agent, one person that classified uh, Tahitian pearls, 150 Tahitian pearls, and we now try to reproduce it artificially with the name procedure. And the classification rate in percentage is here shown for all the 100 80 different feature vector constellations that we calculated based on all these different chromatic indices. The first thing we can see, we have indeed a significant variation of classification results. It goes almost up to 20% from 90 to 70, which means the first question is answered. There is a significant influence of the choice of chromatic indices on the final classification result. The second interesting thing, the optimum of this classification can be found at the first the chromatic index alpha 166 and the second 106 degree, which are indices that have never been used in the literature, which means both together the very limited use of chromatic indices of maybe 10 limits enormously the potential of classification results of chromatic index application. And secondly, the empirical choice of these indices is not justifiable. We need actually indeed a deterministic choice of which indices to use for a given application. And another uh, human classification called here agent 3, an interesting thing, we have an optimum at a completely different chromatic index, which means it corresponds actually to the priorly cited paper that we need class-specific features, 
because the class distribution is actually completely different because agent 3 has another color perception as agent 1, which means maybe we can as well use the chromatic indices to somehow quantize or at least approximate the human perception of color, which would be very interesting specifically in the case of the color classification of Tahitian pearls. Another interesting result, if we, only, we, if we only take the results for the class blue, the pearls were classified in eight different classes. One of the classes is blue, and for each of the eight different human classifications, and the classification result here. What is shown is the <coughs> maximum classification rate over the whole range of the chromatic indices that we used, and the minimum classification rate in red. For example, for this agent, we have at one specific feature constellation a classification rate of 100% for the class blue, which is actually perfect. But on the other hand, we have a certain index, the minimum, with a classification rate of zero. And this more or less for all the other human classifications as well, which means we have a strong class dependency of the chromatic indices, which means we not only have to choose the chromatic indices based on the color distribution of our application, but on the color classes as well. For example, in the, in, in the cited papers, and generally, actually, mostly they only use two different chromatic indices. But this indicates that we need to choose, and that we as well have to determine the optimal number of chromatic indices, maybe for each color class of chromatic indices. Maybe here we need eight, because we have eight color classifications, or eight, eight color classes for the pearls. And finally, the last question to answer, is it possible to artificially classify the color of Tahitian pearls based on human perception, which as well was done in the same tests. Here we divided the whole uh, data set into training set and test set. This is usually done. You use the first set, the training set, to train the artificial neural network, which means the results in blue correspond to the possibility of the artificial neural network to, to learn the data or to learn the color classes. And afterwards, you present the test data, which is all the remaining images of the pearl, to see if the trained artificial neural network is capable to classify data that, has never, that, that it has never seen before, which is the actual goal, to classify data that it has never seen. And in all of the cases, we are at least at 79% of classification rate, which is actually seeing the, the huge color variety and the, the subjectivity of the color classification of Tahitian pearls, a very pleasant result. Especially as well, because actually for this whole experimental section, we didn't optimize the procedure in regards of color classification. So there are a lot of optimization possibilities to maybe increase even the classification results. So in summary, the choice of chromatic indices has a significant influence <coughs> on the artificial classification of color objects, which stands in sharp contrast to the limited and empirical choice of indices in the literature. Then the results indicate that the number of parameters might have to be defined based on intra- and interclass data distribution, which is what I said, maybe we need eight chromatic indices because we have eight different color classes. And thirdly, very importantly, an artificial classification, color classification of Tahitian pearls based on human perception is possible because it was an initial question and many doubted it, but now we are very confident that we are technically, that it's technically possible to do so. Future work is, well, more or less obviously, this concern, concerns the theoretical part, the development of a deterministic method based on our formulation of chromatic index generation to uh, define or find optimal chromatic indices for a given application, and afterwards, hopefully, apply it to the optimal color class or to obtain an optimal color classification of Tahitian pearls. And secondly, we use now artificial neural networks for classification, but it was slightly arbitrary. There are a lot of other classification methods which we have to test as well if they are better for the given application of the color class classification of Tahitian pearls. And we come to the conclusion. <coughs> so what we've done for within the automatic Naka thickness measurement section, we developed a complete image processing chain to measure the Naka thickness of Tahitian pearls for the first time which means it's a novelty in applied quality assessment. We validated that an efficient automation is possible, which wasn't clear because no one has done it before. And we developed an heuristic circuit detection method, which is actually a new method and might be applied to other applications where you have to detect circular objects within other objects, or at least circular objects where you have some prior information about the geometry of the object. Color classification, we did a formalization of normalized RGB chromatic index calculation, which is 
or actually we have we expect that it has quite an impact on the domain because it's really it's a standard application but so far it wasn't optimized uh, formalized I'm sorry then theoretical work on, to, on the topology of the normalized RGB color space which I haven't had the time to present during this presentation but actually it takes into account the discrete character of the RGB of the original RGB space in regards of the projection to the Maxwell triangle and thirdly an experimental classification to validate the feasibility of an artificial color classification of Dayesian pearls in the scope of the thesis we published three different papers the first one concerning color space theory the second one is a description actually of the global project RAPA rather methodologically the third one automatic NACA thickness measurement of Tahitian pearls but it dates back to 2015 which means their results are old that's why we submitted a fourth paper computer vision based NACA thickness measurement of Tahitian pearls which contains all the results of the NACA thickness measurement that I just presented and at least two more papers in progress that we hope to publish the first one containing the formalization of the normalized RGB histogram binning and second one topological normalized RGB histogram binning and at a certain moment but probably the results of the, uh, in the of the thesis manuscript are not sufficient because it's not optimized specifically for the classification of Tahitian pearls but if we do so a third paper on the application of all the theoretical work to the classification of Tahitian pearls I'm early I talked too quick well that leaves me time to thank the colleagues from the Direction de Ressources Marine et Menier for giving us access to their x-ray machines and providing us with x-ray images and with the knowledge and with support for our project thank you very much and our colleagues from Ephemer for providing us access to their pearls giving us the possibility to get color images and along with the human classification of the color images to do the work that we've done and to you of course for being here thank you very much <laughs>